<laughs> well, my name is Waylon Lewis um, with Elephant Journal, and I am honored to be here with uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends who I've never met. I don't think Maggie Doyne. Uh, Maggie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my honor. Um, so um, let me adjust the speaker view because I don't want to see myself. There we go. Um, <laughs> if only it were so easy in life, you just like adjusted your ego view and then you couldn't view your own ego. You, you were just enlightened. Um, so Maggie, you wrote a book. I did. We both wrote a book at the same time. Here it is. That's my book, baby. <laughs> yours, um, yours beat mine to to the starting gate. So, uh, what is it about? I mean, tell tell people your kind of you know the story you've told a thousand times, like the basic like Wikipedia entry of what your book is about, what your story is, and maybe why you wanted to share it. Yeah, it's called Between the Mountain and the Sky. It is a story of me, a girl who grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, ended up taking a step off the beaten path and traveling to India and then ultimately Nepal, where I fell in love in with- In your the like gap year after high school, right? Exactly, exactly. Started with the gap year. And then ultimately I met a friend, I traveled to Nepal, a, a Nepali friend, and um, came upon a riverbed where children were breaking rocks in order to survive. And they were child laborers as young as three years old. And I just had a sort of standstill moment where I was like, what has happened to us as a human family where children are needing to work to survive and have food to eat? And I don't wanna live on a planet like this, I wanna try to figure out what help, help looks like and what my role is and how to figure out my privilege and what I've been given and, and try to make this better and create a world where children are safe and educated and loved. And ultimately I became a mother um, and we created a community organization empowering children and, and the women of Nepal. And I've lived there for 17 years now. Amazing. I feel like <laughs> I interviewed, when did we last talk? Like Gosh. 10 years ago, right? Early, early in the journey. Yeah. You were early champion and believer. Oh my God. I mean, to me, you're, you're very sweet, but to me, your story is that moment when you're, I forget her name, the little child. Yeah. yeah Hima. Hima. Um, where you, didn't just keep walking, you know? And we've all had those moments a thousand times. Um, I mean, we have those moments dozens of times in Boulder, Colorado, where I live. There's, you know, like in much of the US since the Trump and pandemic era, um, the homeless populations have exploded in, in a, on a level where, that we've never experienced. And you mm -hmm. have these moments when you're like, I don't know what to do. And then, you just keep going yeah and that every time that moment happens it dulls our heart so what was it about that moment was it being that you were 19 but I mean what was it about that moment where you stopped and you said I mean the cool thing is you didn't stop and say I'm gonna fix this you just said I can't keep going and you asked a million questions yeah it was it was a stopping of time and just looking into a child's eyes who looked like me and I felt that moment of compassion that moment of connectedness and I think I was young enough to know that I didn't have the answers I couldn't be like all right well I'm gonna bring suburban New Jersey to Nepal and you know right. change this or you know but I but I knew enough to ask the right questions and figure out what help would look like and and to ask some of the right people like you asked community that lady who ran the store I think it was like you asked locals and you really and you googled you got an overall sense of what was happening in Nepal yeah yeah it was like why do we live why are we accepting that we live in a world where children have to work from the age of three to survive? Why are we affecting, accepting a world where children don't have their most basic human needs and rights met? And why is this okay? And what do we do to change it? 
And that was the beginning of the journey and then kind of finding local people and meeting my co-founder Tope. And um, the book was an opportunity to go into some of those questions and dive in. And I had been through my own kind of processing and uh, it was a letter to my children, a love letter to Nepal. And I felt like a duty and a responsibility to kind of pass the baton on to all of us and to other people who maybe want to do this work or have similar questions and kind of get below the surface of the headlines of like, oh, young girl moves to Nepal with a backpack and, and, and go deeper and bring Tope's character to life and talk about the people and the place. And what I feel like is transformational is that this works. Like children, children can be cared for and we can live on a planet where we take care of each other as people and children. Yeah, I remember when you, you know, when last we met, you you were like a national story, a headliner, you know, mm -hmm. like it really impacted everyone who looked at the story or looked at our world and, and had that moment that I was talking about or that you were right about where the world stops and you're like, what do, am I going to do something? Am I going to care? Or am I going to cover up my heart a little bit and keep going? Not because I'm a bad person, because but because I'm speedy or I don't know what to do or so. And I was telling you in the green room, what I love about this book is it's, um, and it sounds silly saying it, but it's such a beautiful and raw story. And it goes so much deeper than the headlines. And you know, I was saying myself, I, I usually prep for interviews, but I don't read the full book. And here I'm like, I'm pushing aside the eight books I'm half reading around my house. And this is my next book. So I'm curious, like, you know, what do the headlines always get wrong or, or what do they not touch in this story? Because it really changed your, I mean, it fu has fully changed your entire life at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, <sighs> It's completely changed my life. I've learned so much. I I wanted the chance to tell like the truth, the grittiness of it. I think a lot of times in the nonprofit world, you talk about the shiny and the exciting and yeah. the, all that's working. Because you're trying uh, to fundraise and you're trying to support the wonderful cause, but you're trying to put the best foot forward. Yeah, and your livelihood depends on it. And in, in our case, like my children's livelihood and their future. And I believe in this work with every single cell in my body. And yet um, I wanted the chance to talk about all the other things. And really because I believe that it does work and that we can have a world where children are cared for, but that it's going to take all of us and yeah. um, all of us taking small acts. So I wanted the takeaway of the book to be like, you actually don't have to go 8,000 miles away. Um, I wanted people to feel hopeful. I wanted people to feel a lightheartedness about it. I also wanted to tell the truth about the hard things and the complicated things and why I feel like development has failed. Um, but it's not a development book. It's a, it's a coming of age story. It's a love story. It's about motherhood. It's about loss. It's about culture. Um, it's about power and privilege and all of the hard questions of our time that when we want to help, where do we even start? Where is my place? What is your place? Um, so it was, it was a journey. It was hard. I wanted to throw it out a thousand times. I wanted to throw the manuscript out. I wanted to quit. I thought it was impossible. Um, but I just stuck through it knowing that I could hand it off to my children at the end of the day. And I got the box of books and the first thing I did was handed it, hand it over to my kids who are interestingly enough, my age, my children are now 18, 19, 20, the wow. same age as when the book began. And wow. I feel like I have, you know, stories to share with them and a piece of my heart. So it was a gift. So the book begins by kind of laying out like, uh, you know, a typical morning. Uh, can you give people an idea? Like, what have you done? Your, you and your community built a school or a community center? Yeah, we have a full service community school that serves orphan, vulnerable, at risk children. And it's a safe place for people and community members to come. We have a women's center, we have a sustainable farm. We built a green campus. It's completely self generating, biodynamic, it's beautiful. Um, we have a 
uh, open uh, medical center and wellness program for at-risk families. We have two safe home interventions, one for at-risk adolescent girls, another for children who don't have families to support them. Um, it's grown into a community. We kind of set out to say, what does change look like for a community who has been through civil war and unrest, political instability, hunger, it's one of the most food deficit rural regions in the world, um, high orphan population, natural disasters, you know, what, what does full transformation look like? We went in to open eye with that question and 17 years later, we feel like we have answers and not easy answers. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was also answering that question of what is the typical day in the life and bringing Nepal to life and bringing our family to life because we have a home with, you know, 48 kids and what is that like? What does a loving childhood look like? How do we change the orphan narrative um, and instill a loving childhood in kids? So it's all about story and uh, childhood and joy, uh, but also loss and the resilience of the human spirit. So, you know, as a business owner, I feel like, you know, I got into it for the mission and then I spend half my days like in Zoom meetings or trying to negotiate between different wonderful people's different ideas and wants and needs. I'm curious, like going into this as a 19 year old now with this, it sounds like a pretty huge and diverse organization and I'm sure you have amazing help. But do you ever feel like, you know, lost in, like, what was the biggest challenge, like, in terms of that you weren't expecting? Because you're going in being a mother and a caretaker of all these children, but on some level, you're also running a big organization. Yeah, I guess, like, as a CEO, as a co-founder, yeah. knowing when to zoom in and focus on the micro but then zoom out and look at the bigger picture and the model and the strategies and how we move forward you know and especially as founders you you don't go into it thinking that your day is going to be spent looking over financials and sticking to a budget making cuts here and yeah. hr policies you don't go into it with a lot of that and you have to learn as you go so just keeping that learning mentality, um, you know, keeping a fundraising hat on all the time, even when you don't want it. It is really hard. I also got to talk about that really openly of what it is like on the inside and some of the hard parts about it. Yeah, when my husband read the book, it's like the stuff that people don't really want to read about. Like, do you want to know about my day sitting at computers, <laughs> great yeah. applications? But my husband was one of the first readers and he's like, I feel like you've missed this huge part of your life, which is just dealing with stuff like yeah. at a computer. You know, a lot of times when we talk about our work, you only talk about the shiny and the bright and not like, you know, those, th those moments where you're just like, oh, why am I doing this? So I, I tried to go back and kind of paint some of that stuff into the book in a way that was exciting and relatable. Well, yeah. he's a good, he's a good editor and counselor. And um, <laughs> because yeah, in the Buddhist tradition, we, we call it heaven, earth, and mm -hmm. human in between. And earth is all the details. Like it's kind of easy to have an amazing, amazing mission but then to actually plant everything and, you know, you literally have a farm, so I don't need to tell you anything. Um, that's, yeah. that's where a lot of us get tripped up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the head, the heart, the hand, all of them coming together and knowing that you can't just go in it with rose, rose colored glasses and good intentions are not enough. That has to come together with community and people and strategy and looking at the whys and, and problem solving and problem solving really complicated issues around you know gender inequality and sustainability and violence against women and children and um politics yeah it was it was really really challenging <laughs> and really challenging. do you do you ever feel like you know what's the talking head song like this is not my beautiful life like do you ever wonder what the heck you got yourself into like you know it's this is such an all-encompassing and committed mission that you have it's completely derailed any life you thought you would have had 
<laughs> is your life. Do you ever, do you ever feel regret about that? Never. Oh. I never, ever. I mean, lucky for me, I just have to look into the face of a child. Mm. I mean, that's how you feel hope. That's how you feel inspiration. That's why you choose to keep going. That's why I chose, I think I would have walked away if it was anything else but children. Right. <laughs> and, and our love of children and our love of the community. And it's so people focused. And so in those moments of overwhelm or just hopelessness or despair, like try it. You just look at the face of a little child and yeah. see potential and see hope and see wonder and see that a belief that we're all going to be okay. Um, and I've been lucky to have a life that got me on track right away to a sense of purpose because I've never doubted the purposefulness of it. I've yeah. never doubted that it's work. You never question a child's life and be like, why did I do that? Um, it's, it's a huge immense responsibility to shoulder, but luckily we have a team and luckily, you know, yeah, we have a real focus on mission and a vision. And in our lifetime, I wanna see a world where I can look to my grandchildren and say, we did it. We figured this out. We don't have to have kids who are cold and hungry and not going to school. And yeah, so it's, it's been easier in my field, I think, to keep my eyes on the prize. Yeah. You know, and then going the other direction, do you ever feel like, okay, we kind of got it down what we're doing. Now we have to work with the government or we have to get bigger funding and like create a thousand of these all over. Yeah, I, 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 unfortunately, there is this sense of urgency where yeah. it's the, when you love kids so much, you also know that there's more like, and you see that it works and you're dropping off your child at college and they're getting their first jobs and they're graduating. It, it kind of makes you the sense of like more and more, I have to get to more kids. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've tried to, you know, share that sense of urgency with the world in this mm -hmm. book. And I think it's really easy right now as a human family to like close up and just be like, there's violence everywhere. The environment is dying. The world is dying. I'm just gonna close up my little circle and protect what I can protect and hold on for life for what I can, for what I can hold on to. Mm. And actually our call to action has to be to open and share and connect yeah. and have hope and stay positive and keep doing our small actions. But when fear comes in and when, you know, we're up against so much, it's just, you just want to curl up and quit yeah. and yeah. you can't. That's exactly when we're called even more to, to show up. So, and the good news is that if we open up and we try to be a benefit to others and we ask questions and we try to do it properly and ethically and fully with good intention, our life is actually... I mean, that's why I asked you that question. Our life is actually more fulfill fulfilled, not always joyful, it can be hard, but fulfilled um, than if we just curl up in a fetal position and watch endless mediocre shows on Netflix and eat ice cream, which is fun for like an hour, but we can't do that for the rest of our lives. Hopefully. No, no, we need to really look at how to live a purpose-driven life, whatever that looks like for you, for me, for everybody. It's just like, how do we how do we leave this place better? Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, maybe to get back to, to a little bit of the story. Um, so when you first ran into Hima, um, she was five or something, six. Yeah. She was super young and she's working like very seriously, like the furrowed brow. And when you asked around, it turned out that sending her to school would cost how much? Oh, it was like a $7 admission fee, a few more dollars for a uniform, uh, figuring out some of the barriers, you know, a pair of school shoes and some books. It felt like so simple and so tangible and something that even like with babysitting money that I could do and then that we could do as a community. And when you ask the people what they wanted more than anything, it was education and, yeah. you know, that was, yeah. that's, education is the greatest equalizer. It's the greatest opportunity. It's the greatest way to stop and change violence and the trajectory of our world, stop poverty in its tracks. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible force. And so it was like 10 bucks 
and your jaw dropped. And, and then, you know, I love that you asked the question like, well, she may not want to go to school. Her parents, you know, because the parents need their children to work sometimes when they're in a rough situation. But her mom was overjoyed. She was overjoyed. It was her entire dream to go to school. Exactly. exactly. So that's one thing. You know, you drop $10, you bus off, you continue on your journey. But, you know, what was it? How, how did it then become a bigger, you know, more rooted mission? Yeah, well, it, it started in that like light of the, yeah, the, the, oh, this is easy, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went on one kid and then two kids and then three kids. And then, um, it just became something that we started really digging into and it was the riverbed filled with children breaking rocks. So the initial, you know, microcosm belief was that maybe we could walk across this riverbed one day and not see a single child breaking rocks. And then we started to kind of work on how a child thrives and grows in community, despite all of these hardships. And it's, it's you know, a child needs clean water. They need um, psychosocial support. They need family support. Um, sometimes they need an intervention if they don't have parents um, and a loving family. Uh, and some of these children had had brutal backgrounds already at their yeah. young age complete unthinkable loss and human tragedy and that was the group of children we wanted to work with and target and kind of show that they could become change makers and leaders and uh so it became about like raising children in their communities and giving them a quality education um you know and just all the things they needed to grow up and then launching them out into their communities and the world as like amazing people. And it's really simple. It's just about like love and giving kids what they need and a thesis that like, if you stick with it, children will grow up and be loving um, forces in their communities and in the world and they'll give back and they'll have careers and they'll, you know, you stop and change the trajectory of violence and poverty and suffering. Yeah. And um, there's so much here, but uh, many of them are going to college now, the, the oldest ones, yeah. right? <laughs> college. I'm in the era of parenting kids who are like signing their first lease for their apartments and, you know, putting their CV and their resume together. It's really fun and it's an adventure. And, you know, you put in a lot of, our team puts in a lot of, you know, it's been 15, 16 years. And then all of a sudden you see like this, a blossoming explosion of a yeah of all those years turning into something it's been really fun yeah mm. it yeah, worked talk, talk about a trajectory change from like you know their life expectancy and safety can't be that good as children in a you know working that hard in a riverbed um to going to college and you know they're worrying about you know, their rent and, you know, having a nice, <laughs> like a nice bookshelf or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Human needs, human rights, human family. You say it's simple and it is on some level because you just come back to love and caring about these children and their lives. But it's also, there's a lot of questions, which I also feel like you've addressed just because you're a good and thoughtful human um, maybe you could help us with some of those questions. Because I feel like I was telling you in the green room, I'm often in this Twitterati world of like liberals who seem to just like hang out with their phones on Twitter all day and, and shoot holes in anyone trying to do anything good. Um, and on mm -hmm. one level, I agree with them. Like there are serious issues and questions that need to be considered and addressed and, and grappled with. And on the other hand, you know, as Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, love has to be active love or it's not love. So, you know, it can't be passive love, like thoughts and prayers. Um, so, you know, the first obvious question is you're a 19 year old babysitter. You're, you wind up using your babysitting money of a couple thousand bucks. Like, how did you grapple with like, who am I to help or, you know, white savior complex, all these you know, development has failed often, even when it's well-intentioned, not always, but often. How did you grapple with all that? 
Yeah, there wasn't the language for the white savior complex at that time. Um, that was later. I, I'm not. I'm not Christian, first of all. Right. Um, so that was, and I think um, I had Tope, who was a local, and our women and our board and the people themselves, and just knowing that my role was to take a seat back and listen, and um just be like one piece of the puzzle what i did have was access to resources um to just help bring their dreams and their vision and uplift what they wanted uh, in their community and i knew that that was my place right along i knew that the answer wasn't me like bringing in new jersey and my cul-de-sac that i grew up on and my public school i knew the answers from all of my reading and my learning and being mentored by nepali people um, I was going to lie within the community itself. Um, and at the same time, I felt that there was a call to action. Um, and I didn't feel like I could just turn around and look away and leave a child, you know, breaking rocks on a riverbed. So it became a we, uh, a group and a team and a community effort. And it stayed that way. And when we studied and looked at why development efforts had failed, um, we just strategized around that and built our strategies uh, in a different way and studied it and then um, started really small and really simple and slowly and organically step by step uh, and embrace the strengths of the culture in the community. And that's why we're here 17 years later. But I knew that like my place was to go out and um, turn, uh, create impact, you know, even when we won some of the awards, and I talk about this in the book, it was like, oh, you know, but then our whole tools, Tope and I, my co-founder was just to like, go and create impact with, <laughs> with what we could and turn resources into impact and get it into the hands of the people. So that's how I grappled with that, just learning and staying, you know, knowing that I knew nothing as a 19 year old babysitter, but I had something. So I tried not to use it as an alibi for, not doing anything at all and not taking any action, but also with like, yeah, it was, I think it was just a healthy combination of knowing that I didn't know and that I needed help and needed to learn and had the people there and the right team of people. There was also a commitment, you know, to give you some credit. There was a, I mean, you changed your entire life. Like a lot of times, I think the white savior complex is like, you're on vacation, you see this awful thing, you do out of the sweetness and goodness of your heart want to help, but you don't listen enough and you don't, you don't stick. You don't, you know, it becomes like, oh, I'll fundraise and send some, or I'll leave them a machine that then will fall apart a week later because one nut is missing. You know, there is a commitment. And I think the co-founder thing, as you mentioned, um, you know, and your commitment to working with that community and seeing what they wanted. I and mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, we know that now. And luckily, I think the conversation that's come to the front and center is great. I think it's really important. It's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, so hopefully with our model and kind of what we've learned and what we've developed, we can just share that, you know, just share yeah. this. This is what's worked. These are we, not to say we were perfect and we didn't make mistakes or I didn't make mistakes. Yeah. I talk about those really openly. Um, and this is a conversation and a dialogue that needs to happen. How do we help? What does help look like? How do we decenter ourselves and also dig in and, and do the work that needs to be done and, and use our power and our privilege? And those of us who are educated and free and empowered and safe, how, how do we give back? Because that was, that was my journey that I went on and that I wanted to share. Um, so yeah, we've already touched on this, but all those lessons how do you share that? Obviously this book is going to be a big way that you can share that with other folks who are struggling to help and serve, but how else can you kind of get this hard won knowledge into other people's hands? Yeah, I think it's about uplifting, um, the stories of the people around me and the people of Nepal and bringing those stories and those characters to life and using a platform to, to talk about the issues and, and bring them front and center and not forget about this 
incredibly important conversation that needs to be happening. Um, yeah. And the book was a tool. Social media is a really powerful tool. Yeah. Um, our children themselves becoming spokespeople and talking about, you know, they're grownups now. Yeah. <laughs> um, sharing what they feel comfortable with. And it's, uh, it's been amazing. Has there ever been any interaction or, or um, help or interest from the government in making this happen on a wider scale? Yeah, they're starting to be. I mean, Nepal went through a lot, many years of instability, but has come out and yeah. finding their way to democracy and elections. And uh, the Nepal, we work hand in hand with the Nepali government as well. And uh, they are interested and we definitely wanted to figure out what we do, refine it, and then export it to other places um, and, and partnering with other local people. So it's in the, it's in the horizon and it's really exciting. That is exciting because there is that sort of beautiful curse where if you, if you can't walk past Hema in the beginning, then you can't walk past any child in that riverbank or riverbed. And then you, on some level, can't walk past any children in all of Nepal who are going through the same thing, et cetera. Yeah, and we just keep going until we, in pockets and in tending to our patches and yeah. until we get a better world. Yeah. yeah, that's what it's gonna take all of us, like together working where we can, where we are with what we have. I think that's a quote, who's that a quote from? Start where you are, do what you can, use what you have. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, um, it's, <laughs> not, it's not Pema Children, but she has a book called Start Where You Are, and in oh. it, she, she discusses, like, if we wait to be, to have our act together and everything, for everything to be perfect, we'll never get started. Right. So I do love that encouragement that anywhere mm -hmm. anyone is, we can do our thing, and it can look completely different, whatever our thing is, mm -hmm. and our thing may come to us like Hema did, you know. It doesn't have to be our, our skills that we already have. Totally. 100%. So who was that quote? Did you find it? No. <laughs> Actually, see the children. I want to say it's Toni Morrison. Oh, it's Arthur Ashe. Oh. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. Arthur That's Ashe. That's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Use what you have. Do what you can. I love that. I've written about that in terms of privilege. That privilege is often like a bad word now. But I, I hope the refinement of that is unacknowledged or unused privilege is kind of a bad word. But if you have privilege, ultimately, we want everyone to have privilege, you know, safe streets and a place to rest their head at night and good food and education. So it's just incumbent on all of us to to make use of our privilege in whatever way we can. A hundred percent. Like when we talk about these issues, it's not about, oh, give up all of your worldly possessions and a roof over your head and your latte. It's about, no, use and, and leverage our power and our platforms and our voices to uplift with allyship and creating a world where everyone has warmth and access and opportunity and coffee and tea and whatever <laughs> clean yeah. water it's like it's not about the yeah it, in the beginning of the journey I think I was like very self-righteous like do you know what's happening in Nepal and I've kind of softened over the years and realized no 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 it's it's more about looking at the how and how we can create this world for everyone that's interesting. So in the beginning, you were like, how can people stand by and not, not act? I, I think I still get into that a lot. Like I, I'm like, it's totally okay if you don't know, but if you do know, how can you not act? And again, you don't have to do everything in the whole world and, and burn out and quit, you know, which is very quick cycle. A lot of people in development or in service get into, but how do you not help in your own way in the way that you can I do find that really, I get really discouraged and stuff sometimes. Yeah, we all do. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> but your solution to that over time through experience was just the how. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I think like 
you know, in the beginning, you're just like, why, you know, why I was born to you, you are born into, you know, the right place and the right time you win the birth lottery. Yeah. I think about myself on the riverbed. Why was I, you know, given so much and handed so much. And then I'm looking and staring in the face at a child in a different place in a different time who's breaking rocks with a mallet. Right. And you can ask yourself why, like, why, why is this, why are we living like this? Um, but I, I, I kind of just think we need to look at how can we help each other? How can we coexist? How can we create more equality? How can we create more opportunity? How do we do this and then get to work at doing it? We don't have time to like debate the stuff. We just got to get to work. And oh, I love that. The world we want to live in. Yeah. Amen. <sighs> Damn right. A women. Um, so uh, maybe final question, because I know you're in the basement of your, you've been on your <laughs> book tour, your international book tour. So you're in the basement of your parents' house, right? In New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What do they think of all this? I think they're proud. Um, you know, in the beginning, it started at, at like a rickety old phone booth and calling them and asking me to send their, send me my life savings of babysitting money. Yeah. <laughs> and just to see a community and a team of people and yeah, an organization and um, children grown up and, into the world it's it's come very full circle many many times it's been a lot of full circle moments and yeah yeah i guess the the better question because obviously they must be so proud the better question is like what did they think of it in the beginning when you didn't have any proof of concept and they're like their little baby who they did ha have trust and faith in you know they were cool parents and you were a cool daughter doing good things but I mean, did they have moments when they were just really concerned and? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I say in the book, like, I'm sure every parent wants to have a child who wants to go to Nepal and right. help people and create opportunity and make the world better. But then when it came down to it, a lot of parents, and I, young people tell me this all the time, like, my parents would have said, no, get home, you're going to college. So the fact that they said yes and let yeah. me go on that journey was a major gift but we had hard moments and questions and you know but yeah it's it's been okay <laughs> yeah I mean as a as a hypothetical parent I don't have kids yet but um uh you know I would just be so concerned I mean as we we read horror stories about women's safety in India and Nepal and yeah, there'd be a level of just basic concern, just fear and love, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. No, for sure. So how I, did you assuage I, their fears? Um, Here, this is a tip for all do-gooding children out there. Yeah, well, I mean, at some point, I think I, I was raised to, uh, to be an adventurer and a questioner. Yeah. And... Um, you know, it goes back to the way that I was raised to, to question and to, yeah, believe in adventure and believe in cultural immersion and looking at your place in the world. So I think in, in the end, it was a huge tribute to them and their parenting and the way they taught me to be grateful and the way they taught me to. I love that. Know. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to meet them. I need a coaching class. I'm engaged and I can't wait to have kids and, uh, that's the kind of parent I want to be is to encourage children to ask questions and to care. Yeah, they, they did a really good job at that. Yeah. Well, tell them, hey, for, from, from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Maggie, thank you so much. I can't wait to read the entire book and I won't wait. I'm going to read it all in a day. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And if you're ever in Colorado, look, look me up. Um, would love to. I can't deep, wait. Deep. We can I get one of those lattes. What's yeah, that? I have to get there. We're going to do it. Yeah, there's, these... there's huge independent bookstores here too for your book and I can help set that up. So whenever you're back. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Maggie Doyne, my hero. Will you hold up the book again? Yeah, Between the Mountain and the Sky. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you.
Thanks Maggie. for celebrating it with me. And congrats to you. I can't wait for your book. <laughs> I know. We won't have to. It's coming in like an like literally I told them I'm in an interview until noon, which is 15 minutes from now. And go hold right. it. Go hold it in your hands. It's Maggie. exciting. It's yeah. a terrifying moment, right? It's a terrifying moment when I'm like terrified there's gonna be a huge typo on the cover, you know. There won't be. Yeah. There won't be. <laughs> yeah. There there will be some typos, but there will be mistakes, but yeah. it's all worth the art of it. <laughs> yeah. How has the experience been of the uh the book tour? Wonderful. It felt like kind of going back in time and holding my hand, my own hand, my 18-year-old self's hand. Aww. And a lot of healing um, and just, you know, sharing and talking and having conversations. And it felt like a big release and uh, it needed to happen. It needed to happen just for me. Yeah, it was really good.